Hello, welcome to Conversations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's conversant is Chloe Cole, who is a California tomboy who was transitioned at the early age of 13, first with hormones and then with surgical interventions to treat what turned out to be self-esteem issues. And she has since detransitioned and now she is doing what she can to get the word out by visiting various state legislatures and speaking out about her treatment by the gender industrial complex. She is such a wonderful, well-spoken young woman, and I'm so glad to finally get to speak with her in person. You can find links to her socials and to the fundraiser for her lawsuit against Kaiser Permanente for her treatment at the hands of the so-called gender specialists down there in the description. Without further ado, here is Chloe Cole. You have been very busy. Yeah. <laughs> I just got back from Florida like three, about three nights ago, I think. What were you doing there? Um, so I was at a convention for two days and uh, I also happened to be there during a, a hearing in the house. So I testified on some legislation and then I also went to FSU with Billboard Chris just to hang around and talk to some people. It was pretty cool. Yeah. When did you uh, come out? Start going public? Um, I think like in spring of last year was when I started speaking publicly on Twitter. So it was Twitter was your first step. Um, yeah. Before that, I was in the, the Discord server for the official r slash dtrans subreddit, but um, I mean, I mostly either just like lurked or I would have conversations in the subreddit, the, the server and the server only. I wouldn't really talk about my experience anywhere other than like personal social media. Yeah. What was your feeling of the, uh, the dtrans spaces and the, the community there? Um, pretty much immediately I noticed just how much how different it was from the trans community. Like within the trans community, even while I was transitioning, I felt like I was very stifled and I couldn't really talk about my my own differences and opinions. Like I would get shut down pretty quickly. And th 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 that kind of that kind of behavior like further radicalized me after after so many years. Like before when I was initially during during my early years of transitioning, I naturally actually leaned towards being more conservative, but I was, I was uh, interacting more and more with the trans community and I got crap for being like a trans med or whatever, really stupid stuff like that. I started to think like, well, maybe non-binary identities are valid and you don't need to have gender dysphoria to transition that anybody can be what they want, stuff like that. And but like, as soon as I, I entered that uh, that server, and I was talking to the other detransitioners and your sisters, questioners, and and so on. Almost immediately, like my views were being challenged, and it was it was kind of shocking, but I actually really liked it, and it helped me to just further, I guess you'd say. realize, comprehend what was really going on. With like you? I was, I was pretty lost. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah. With okay. me and in the community and just in general with all this, with all this stuff. Like I realized like the trans community and the doctors lied to me and that I wasn't harming anybody by talking about my experience as I was told. And in fact, that there were many more people out me like there who were in the situation that I was. And it was, that was kind of, kind of comforting, but at the same time, it was terrifying because we were just this community of people who were rejected, outcast by 
another supposedly marginalized community and we didn't really have anywhere for ourselves. And it was nice that we had this little space amongst ourselves to, to talk about our experiences and our hardships and to help each other. But I knew like there's many more of us out there and there has to be, at the time I was the youngest person in that space, I believe. And there weren't really any, any people who transitioned as kids really active in it or speaking out. And I mean, I just, I just knew that there has to be thousands, at least dozens of other kids in, in, in the same situation that I am. And somebody's got to start speaking up. I don't know who will. So you opened a Twitter account? Yeah, um, not immediately. It, it, I, I knew like it would take some time for me to really be healed enough to to be able to take on that kind of thing. And so I just, I went through, I was still, I was still in school at the time. I was, a, I was 17, I was a senior in high school and I kind of wanted to wait until I was out and feeling stable enough and comfortable enough with my, with myself and reconnected with my family and that I had enough support to be able to do that kind of thing. You mentioned healing. What were what was that process like? What were the the things that you had to heal through? I mean, I'd say that the healing process from all this is still ongoing, and it might be for the rest of my life. But especially in the initial stages, I lost pretty much all my friends from school, from the trans community, and even people who had never transitioned but consider themselves allies because they just they didn't want to listen to stories like mine they didn't want to hear about what i what i had to say and i made them uncomfortable and i was also very emotional so i wasn't very pleasant to be around and i was i was very i was very lonely for for a period of time that was that was a big part of what was holding me back i wasn't very emotionally stable and yeah. i was very lonely did you, uh, how did you process that? Like journals or sports or like, did you have a hobby or an outlet of some sort? Um, I started rollerblading and, um, I would kind of just talk about my experiences online on smaller personal accounts yeah. and express myself through artwork. I, I journaled and sketched quite a bit. And I tried to make new friends outside of school. And did, did you have professional assistance during your detransition period? No, no I mean, I, I reached out to all my doctors and my therapist and um, my gender specialist and nothing that they said, none of the information they, that they gave me was, was helpful. Hmm. And I feel like Talking with the same people who encouraged me and got me into this mess in the first place wouldn't be really. And it wasn't. Productive, yeah. Wow. So are you, are you okay talking about the transition process to give my audience? Everybody knows you yeah. already, but. Yeah. So when, when did the idea of gender first present itself to you or a, a, a disconnect with your gender? Um... I mean, growing up, I did have some struggles just with being a girl, with connecting with other girls and with women. And it was really difficult to imagine myself even growing up from a girl into a woman and having to go through experiences like periods and the possibility of things like pregnancy and childbirth and then going through the female aging process and menopause. I didn't want any of that. I mean, I would always hear about how just how rough women had it from other girls and I was already very dissociated from myself as a woman so why would I want anything to do with that I, I I was kind of a quite a bit of a tomboy growing up especially as I got older I really wanted to just be one of the boys and it, it was hard especially when when I hit puberty because that's when boys and girls start to diverge in their bodies and their minds and how they socialize. And 
on one hand, I didn't really particularly enjoy being a girl or other the the, the company of of other girls my age most of the time. Yeah. So but you're not you're not I mentioning really being with. you're not mentioning um, like social expectations or stereotypes so much as the company of women and then your life as a woman. Well, I mean that was that was actually a big part of it too. Like I the stereotype that I had in my head from how I would hear boys talk about the girls and from the media I watched like cartoons and comics was that girls are often kind of stupid and superficial and usually they get in the way of things that are serious or fun and I didn't want to be anything like that you I wanted to be, to be better serious than that. and fun yeah and I I'd say naturally I was I was on the tomboyish, more masculine side in some ways, but in other ways, I would force myself to to dress down, to not really be like the other girls, because I thought that it was a bad thing to be feminine. I thought that it was humiliating. And I I also hit puberty at a pretty pretty young age. And I mean, well, I was like eight or nine. I was oh. going into fourth grade. Yeah. And... You know, even even before I hit puberty, I learned from from TV shows that my older siblings and parents would watch, and from the magazines that my sisters had, and just the the conversations I would overhear. Even that having a developed female body, especially large breasts, was a good thing, a very desirable trait, and that smaller breasts were not desirable; that they're forgettable. And from a very young age, I desired to have a very voluptuous, fully developed female body. And so on top of hitting puberty young and having to deal with comments that people would make on my body, um, and just the, it, it was it was scary, not only, it, it felt like I couldn't catch up to my own body, but on, but this expectation I had that I had to look a certain way and not really matching up to that was, it was hard for me to deal with. I felt like I was, I felt like it was just another thing that made me inferior to, to other girls and women that I would never match up, that I would never be pretty and that there was no point in even trying to be like a woman. Were you able to express this and talk about these feelings? Did anybody hear you? Uh... I mean, I had these feelings, but at the same time, I was so young that it was very difficult to articulate and I didn't really feel close enough to anybody. I felt like my feelings were just trivial and that I shouldn't really really talk about it anyways. Huh. But these these ideas festered because I couldn't figure out how to communicate them and I didn't even know that I didn't know the importance of communicating them. And eventually it started to become I can't match up eventually I can't match up to other women became maybe I would just be better off as a boy. And I, I often felt like I, I looked like and acted like a boy. Like I, I've always had shoulders that are on slightly bigger than average. And I had, at the time I had smaller breasts and my hips weren't very developed. And I liked having my hair short and I didn't like dressing girly all the time. And granted that's, that's all pretty normal. Yeah. But and you're in a very I progressive my, state, right? You're in, you're right. in California, which so it's pretty cool to just hang loose and do your own thing, right? Yeah, I mean, at the same time, though, I live the school I went to in, uh, yeah, in, in a more conservative area. But on top of that, the school I went to from fifth to eighth grade, I was always kind of an outsider. I didn't really have many friends there, and. I was often outcast and, and bullied even. Yeah. So I really didn't feel like I had anywhere to, to fit in. And I turned to the internet at a pretty young age and that's where this where this came in. I, I, I used my computer, my personal computer a lot before I got my first phone, but social, once I started using social media, as, as all the other kids from my age were, that was when this 
I was really introduced to this idea that people aren't always what they're born as, and sometimes they're something else. And how did you, where, what context, like in Reddit or like what forum, like Tumblr, or did you um, stumble on these? For me, things? it mostly started with uh, Instagram. Sometimes I would browse Tumblr a little bit and even on, I would, I, would look, I would lurk a little bit on Reddit as well, but it was mostly Instagram. Um, um, I was 11 when I made my first account and I quickly started to see a lot of content that was very sexual in nature. A lot of it was memes, a lot of it was images of of women and teenage girls who were in very, very sexual contexts and poses. And they were often showing off their, their bodies and how curvy they were. And it reinforced this idea in my head that, I mean, I was already comparing myself a lot to the women and the, the other girls my age around me. But this just added to that, and it made it a lot more difficult for me. Huh. Um, and I also um, would look at like fandoms on those websites, and a lot of these these kids and young adults who were in these uh, these communities also talked about their experiences identifying as gay or bisexual or transgender or non-binary and it was it was it was new to me it was very interesting to me i'd never really seen anything like it before i started to see these posts not only about my favorite video games and cartoons and things like that but also just these people talking about their lives and at the time it was something very unique to me these a lot of these kids were they were people who were quite like me. A lot of them were, were artists. A lot of them were very shy in real life and found comfort in the internet. And there seemed to be like this very closely knit community amongst themselves. And I, I was a person who, throughout a lot of elementary school and throughout middle school, didn't really have a whole lot of friends. And I often felt like nobody really had my back that I didn't really have anywhere to turn to. And this was something that I found pretty touching. And on, on top of that, like all, all these new words and phrases and, and all these colorful flags and images really drew me in, especially because, you know, I was barely starting puberty, but at the same time I was still a kid. And so it kind of had that, that appeal to me as, as a young person. Yeah. And, and what about identities? Uh, did you, did you, uh, you see these people say I'm gay or I'm straight, I'm bisexual, I'm pansexual, all these, all these words, but they're, they're associated with an identity of some sort of right. authenticity. Were you, what were your feelings about encountering that? And did you start to adopt that yourself and say, well, well let me yeah. turn on this one, that one, and play dress up. Yeah. With I mean, naturally I started to, to wonder like, what, is my sexuality what's my gender identity who am i attracted to and what's what's my place in this world who am i and at first i started to experiment with uh labels around my sexuality like bisexual pansexual and and so on and then eventually progressed to well i'm not really quite like a girl so I don't always feel 100% like a girl, so maybe I'm genderless or pangender, and then eventually I just, I just knew that I wasn't, I wasn't a girl at all, and there was only one option. I, I was a boy. I mean, I was quite like the, the boys my age, or so I thought in my head, and I felt like I looked like one, and I didn't like my body very much and I didn't want to be a woman. So what else could I be, right? Yeah. Did you did you want to be 
become not a woman or become a man? Uh, was it like a project that you embarked upon or some sort of adventure? <laughs> right? I, yeah, you could, you, could, you could say all of that could apply. I mean, I didn't want to be a woman, but at the same time, I had this very... I had this very idealized view of what being a boy was. I mean, I, I really looked up to to my older brothers and I felt like more than anything, I was more like my 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 brothers and my dad and my, my boy cousins more than my sisters or my mom. Yeah. So, you know, kids, uh, you ask a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they'll say like fireman or a policeman or a doctor. Um, but then with gender, like, I want to grow up and be a man. Like, it, it's not like an occupation. It's something else, but it still has kind of the same kind of feeling there. I'm going to become this, this thing uh, that I see in the world. But when, when you, did you start to envision your life as a man? Like, what would it be like for you when, you know, being a man in the world or being a boy in the world? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was mostly little little fantasies like not having breasts and be able, being able to, to go out shirtless, to work out, to go on runs and to swim. And a lot of it was very social. Like I really wanted to, to just be like the boys and to be with them. No, no, I wanted to be like my brothers and or, or just... not, I mean, I was still attracted to, to boys, but it wasn't necessarily like in, in a romantic or a sexual manner. I just, I wanted to be friends with them and I wanted to be a part of them. Yeah. I, these, I really looked up to, I just thought that, that boys and men were better in every way, stronger, bigger, smarter, more fun to be around, funnier, happy-go-lucky. Were, were there I thought like the male life was. fictional characters that you idolized or idealized? Like you want to be like Axl um, Rose or not, not modern day Axl Rose, but Axl Rose from like 1992 or something like that. Um, I can't really think of any particular characters now. Yeah, I did. I did like. like I did watch a lot of cartoons and video yeah. games and, and stuff, but I didn't really desire to be like a character. I wanted to be. I wanted to build my own self. Hmm. But at the same time, this idea of being a boy that I had was pretty much a caricature of what boys actually, what being a boy is actually like. I mean, even boys, even, even a boy is a caricature of a boy or what we think of as like a boy scouts. Like there's no idealized boy. There's no true boy. There's just a bunch of males there that have male typical patterns of behavior. Yeah. Did you start to act like a boy or like intentionally, uh, I don't know, I guess you can do it with your, uh, with your clothing, but did you start to adopt what you imagined to be boy-like behaviors? Yeah. Um, I mean, I started wearing more. I started dressing more like my older brothers, like cargo shorts and pants and and jeans and sweatpants and t-shirts, button-up shirts, uh, sneakers, um, baseball ha baseball caps, all pretty stereotypical. But <laughs> I also started to to get shorter and shorter haircuts gradually. Um, But like and, your speaking patterns or like, did you uh, yeah, I, mimic? I tried, I tried to mimic my, the, uh, the mannerisms, mannerisms that my brothers and, um, the boys from school had. Did you pull it off? Um, <laughs> at first. Or did well, you did you stand out like like when people started to see you change in this direction? What were the responses to you? I, I started to stand out a lot, obviously, because it was a very it was a very drastic change that I was taking in under a year. I mean, I was towards the end of my seventh grade year when I started socially transitioning, and by the time I was in my eighth grade year, people started 
people started to notice. And because I attribute this mostly to just being in middle school, because middle schoolers aren't nice. People that age are just, they're just not nice. But they, uh, I started to become even more of an outcast and I didn't have as many friends and what few friends I had would often make fun of me to my face and mistreat me just because I was presenting myself differently. So at first I wasn't really accepted for how I was presenting myself. But that, that just pushed me further into it. Like I wanted to prove these people wrong desperately. Okay. And did you get um, advice or a pathway from the internet? Like you're hanging out in these forums, like how do I, how do I do this? Where do I go? What do I do next? Did you start to formulate a plan? Yeah, so as I started to learn more about transition from these, uh, these accounts, these other kids that I would follow and just learn about how how the trans transition process worked and seeing how how badly they desired it and how they thought it was the right course for them. Naturally, I started to feel the same way for myself and the research that I did on transitioning, um, which included um, information from actual official medical resources, including from my own healthcare provider, seemed to point to transition as the only means of treating gender dysphoria. Was gender dysphoria, uh, how did it present for you? Did you develop it uh, where you weren't just dissatisfied with being uh, a girl or not being a boy, but getting really dissociated, looking at yourself in the mirror, uh, seeing something else or? Right. Yeah, I, I would. It, my body image issues progressed from, I feel like I don't look like enough of a girl to, I'll never be a girl to, I should be a boy instead. Why, why am I not a boy? And the disconnect between me and another woman was, was still there, but it became less and less painful. And I started to notice more the disconnect between me and, and boys and males. And I just, I wanted to be one of them, you know? So it was, it was painful. And I thought of myself as a boy. Eventually started to fall into this, this delusion that I actually somehow was a boy despite being biologically female. And when did the uh, the professionals get involved with you? Yeah, so after a few months of starting, quietly starting my social transition, um, I decided that I wanted to start medically transitioning and I knew that I would have to tell my parents that if I wanted to do that and I wanted them to, to be aware, I wanted them to be involved. And so I came out to them through a letter that I left on I think it was the coffee table and uh, it just said like, it was pretty basic I think, it was just like, just telling them about my feelings, about how I wanted to be a boy and I wanted them to start calling me their son and to buy a new name. And their initial reaction was, they were, they were, they were shocked, they didn't really expect this out of me. but. They, they were okay with me changing the way that I presented myself and uh, wearing different clothes and getting shorter haircuts. And they tried to go along with my, uh, my preferred name. It wasn't easy for them, but at the same time, they're very cautious and they didn't really want to, they didn't want me making any permanent decisions and they didn't want their hand forced. They didn't want to be involved in any decisions that I made. They wanted to leave it to me that they wanted to leave it to me to make that kind of, to make my, make any medical decisions once I was at least 18. But they, they tried to be supportive of me, but I, I pushed further, I pushed more and more for medical transition. I kept asking my parents to, to get me, um, 
to get me on hormones. And well, after pretty much immediately after I came out, they was when they decided to send me to the therapist to try and figure out what was going on to see how what to what to do about this. Yeah. And I think their assumption was that there was something behind behind these feelings and that it would be discovered and that that would be treated instead, but it didn't happen. They, I mean, pretty much as soon as I walked in, it was just like, well, what's, what do you want us to call you? What's your preferred name and pronouns and what do you identify as? And I wanted to be a boy. And they just took it as a fact that okay. I was a boy. Yeah. And there really was no questioning of whether there might be something behind this. Really? I there was, was, a, I was there free, was yeah. a talking therapy, like a, any sort there, of probing? I mean, they, they, they did. They did ask about, um, I think they, I can't really, it's hard to remember specifically so far back because I was 12 going on 13. Oh. Quite, quite, quite some time ago, but they, they knew that I had underlying issues actually, but they didn't do anything about it. My gender dysphoria was just treated as a completely separate issue. Okay. Have you, have you and, looked through the notes, the psychologist's notes? Have you seen like how yeah, they Yeah, I've requested my records. Um, I haven't looked through them all, but... In my complaint um, for my lawsuit against Kaiser, it says that, um, I mean, the psychologists, they, they knew that I was previously diagnosed with, uh, with ADHD when I, was, when I was a kid, and that I had symptoms of depression and social anxiety, and even an eating disorder. It was, yeah, they, they just never paid any mind to it. Huh. It was all it was all pushed aside in favor of my gender. It was my gender that was the issue. Yeah. A just brief pause on the ADHD and eating issues. How did ADHD? What did that mean to you? Or how how did you behave? Uh, what was? Like, yeah. So. Are you just a sporty, squirrely kid, rambunctious, tearing things up all the time? Well, yeah, I mean, outside of the classroom and at home, I was, but I mean, I found it really difficult to, to concentrate on schoolwork and I had issues with organization. And I think if anything, it was just a misdiagnosis. I think it was just, I don't think I actually have ADHD. I think it was just, I was exposed to technology from a pretty young age. And obviously I would prefer that over boring schoolwork and homework and I think, I pretty strongly believe that I'm actually on the spectrum. And I was actually, I've had two screenings in my life for autism. The first being when I was in preschool or kindergarten. And <laughs> I, they said, no, your, your kid's not autistic because she's, she's too smart. She, she speaks too well. She's too, she's too eloquent to, to possibly be on the spectrum. And the second screening was um, when I was 16 or 17. It happened after I stopped transitioning and it was actually my gender specialist who told me like, hey, I think you, you have some pretty strong autistic symptoms. So I, I'm gonna refer you to a screening. And Such I got pretty much the same answer again because I was too smart, too, too, mm -hmm. uh, too verbally developed to, to be in the spectrum this time they said it's it's possible it's it's in the cards but yeah. they just, i guess it's just too too it's easier to diagnose me with something they can medicate right because they also started putting me on adhd meds at age 10 and they kept switching me between meds upping the dose until i was at roughly the average dose for an, an adult male when I was 11, but you know. On what, like Adderall or? Um, well, they started with uh, with long release medications like Concerta, and then I stopped taking them after um, my turn 12, I think. And then they put me on them again at 15, 
um, then, it, then, then it was Adderall and other short release medications. So I was just constantly on the slew of medications, yeah. upping the dose, changing the dose, changing the medication. And, and so you were kind of told by your environment that if you have a problem, medication, medicalization is the solution to yep. a problem. And like that you, every problem I have, it. yeah, and every problem I have is clinical, right? Okay. Wow. Okay. And yeah. then the, I mean, the a lot of disorder, was that uh, uh, related to your body uh, dysmorphia or dislike? or? Yeah, I, I never had an, an actual diagnosis for an eating disorder, but I've always had some, some weird eating habits. And I've often, I grew up with a complex over being too skinny. I would often hear from like my, my older sisters and my, uh, my older relatives that, about how, how skinny I was and that I should eat more. Okay. And you, you really took this criticism seriously. It seems Partially. like what, what you're expressing to me about your childhood, or at least from what you're talking about now about your childhood, is that you very much relied or were very driven to be like an ideal person, ideal woman, uh, yeah. ideal this, or, uh, if, and if I can't get that, then I'll, I'll be a man. If I, if I can't get this ideal, uh, that nobody thinks that I'm, I'm up to. Um, so you really took that seriously. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways I do have perfectionist tendencies, but it's kind of expressed weird in that if I can't meet my, my expectation of what I want or what I should be, then I should do something drastically different. And I think that's, that's a product of me, of, of me being on the spectrum. Like a very, very decisive, either or black or white. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very black and white. Very, I get very fixated on things. And, and during your childhood, your adolescence, your puberty, did you find things that were good to invest yourself in? Did, did your obsessions ever accidentally bear fruit? Like you mastered calligraphy or something like that? Um, I mean, I've been drawing from a pretty young age. I've always been an artist. I've always loved illustrating and I have notebooks and even homework just like sitting in, in boxes of all, of all the, all the drawings I've, I've left in them over the years as a kid. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, in school I was known as the artist, the artistic kid, but I mean, once I started transitioning, I started to go into an artist block and I attribute that to, I think partly, um, the distress that transitioning and transitioning caused for me. And so I didn't really get to hone that during my adolescence, unfortunately. So can, can you, uh, describe, um, did you, did you start binding? Like what was the social transition? Did you get a compressor? Or yeah, I didn't start binding. Out. I didn't yeah. I didn't start binding until after I started medically transitioning actually, which is kind of an unusual thing about my case. Most people mm -hmm. start using like a even if it's just like sports bras or like tape or something to try and make their chest smaller, but I didn't really care about that. I mean, <laughs> I'd say it was like roughly a B cup, so it was noticeable that I had breasts, but I didn't really care about them cuz I thought like oh, I can just like cover it up with a t-shirt or like a hoodie or something and nobody's going to care. But I had an incident um, towards the, the last semester of my eighth grade year when one of the boys who had been bullying me that school year walked up to me in a classroom and he sexually assaulted me. He groped my, my, my breasts. And that was what ultimately triggered me to start binding and hiding my chest. Because well, it, it was just like a week after that, that I got my first binder. Huh. And you were already on uh, hormones? Yeah. I was about three months in, I think. Wait, how old were you when you started uh, hormones? 13. And, I was on uh, blockers and hormones. So how does, how does the blocker work for the female? Um, 
or how did it feel for you? I guess um, th- that cocktail. They were they well, put you I on started tea the at thirteen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I started the blockers about a month or so before I was put on testosterone. Okay. They said just to like clear out all the the production of the natural sex hormones in my body to make way for the exogenous hormones. Yeah. And. Um, I started getting some hot flashes and itching all over my body because it, I was already a few years into puberty, so it basically put me into a state of menopause. And one thing, one thing about usage of puberty blockers in girls that's not really talked about is that if they've already had periods, then it's actually going to induce a period. So the, the, the argument that trans activists make about blockers is that it just allows kids any kid to uh just some time to be in sort of a stasis where they don't really develop either way and so it allows them some time to decide whether uh they want to go through with their natal puberty or with an artificial puberty but in girls if it induces something that they already have negative feelings around then it's obviously going to push them further in a transition. Huh. And it did, it did for me. I, it, was, it, it sucked, it sucked, I hated it. I hated being on it, it made me lethargic, it made me itchy all over, and I was just uncomfortable while I was on them. And I wanted desperately just to go on to the next treatment okay. and to be done with them. And uh, do, you, do you, did you stay on the puberty blockers when you started to get the uh, testosterone? Uh, yeah, um, I was on the blockers for roughly about a year or so until I was 14. I had about, I think it was like three or four shots in total, and there's a spacing of about three to four months between the shots, which the shot the, the shots suck. They, the way they, they did do. them for me was, yeah, they inject into the gluteal muscle, into the butt, so I would go to the doctor's office, get an injection in my butt, and then I would have to sit down and go to school or go on a car ride home. And it, it would be sore for a few days. It, yeah. It's not pleasant. And did you, um, sorry, and sorry, this is, this is very personal, but what was your, did you have a really difficult uh, menstrual cycle before then? Uh, did you have very painful uh, periods? Not difficult in the traditional sense, like you thinking, like they weren't awfully painful. I mean, it, they sucked, but I'd say my cramps were pretty, pretty normal. It was a pretty normal level of pain, but because I was young and just having them, it was hard to adjust to, especially because I also had an irregular cycle, which I mostly attribute to just being young, I only had them for maybe like a year to year and a half before I started on these treatments. And so I didn't really have much time to just grow into my body. But I had a lot of anxiety around my period because other girls would talk about, would talk about how theirs would come monthly, but mine only came about every three to four months. Huh. And I started to feel like there was something wrong with me. Like other, whenever I would tell this to other girls, they would say like, I think you need to see a doctor. Like there's something wrong with you. That's not normal. <laughs> is it? Uh, and, it's irregular, but is it, is it worrisome? I thought it was. Yeah. I mean, I started to wonder like, why mine weren't coming every month like other girls. And I would, I would, I, I became kind of a hypochondriac. I would, I would go, I would go online and just like Google, like, why isn't my period regular? And then I would get all these results that from, I don't know, like WebMD or whatever that are like, this could mean you're infertile. And I thought, (laughs) I thought there was something wrong with me. I was so scared that I wasn't, it was just, I mean, it sounds ridiculous. It sounds funny, but it was just another one of those things that added to the pile, the list of why I was different, why I wasn't like other girls and why I just wasn't ever going to be a functional woman i thought okay yeah and then testosterone comes along that's a toxic thing that's the the root of toxic masculinity how did you take that (laughs) it was i mean it felt great 
Did it? I went from this like month or so long period of being totally lethargic to being on steroids. So that's that's a big part of it. But I mean, almost immediately, I started to notice like the cognitive effects. Like I felt more confident. I yeah. <laughs> started to develop sort of a competitive streak and it was just what? this general feeling of feeling great and, I, and on top of that i was i was excited to finally start on this this path it was a big step for me and very quickly i started noticing the physical symptoms like i had a pretty huge spike in my sex drive and yeah. then I started to... Did you know what to do with that? It was, yeah, that was, it was actually really difficult for me to deal with. It was... Intrusive. Yeah, very. And, and on top of that, uh, I'll get into this later, but all my friends, I mean, I, I was still attracted to, to, to guys, but all my friends were starting to get into relationships in high school. And because I looked like a boy, sound like a boy, seemed like a boy, outwardly, boys just really aren't into that. Most people are straight. And so I would find it, I just found it hard to, to cope with the loss of my dating pool, especially yeah. as I started to get older. But, um, other than that, my voice dropped really quickly. I'd say like within, within two weeks. And okay. that's when people at school were starting to notice like, Hey, there's something seriously wrong here. And then the other physical changes started to come. Like my facial state, my, the shape of my face was starting to change the shape of my body. I started to, my shoulders became even larger and, um, I started to develop more muscle and become more active. And even my eyebrows and my hair were starting to get thicker. So it was a very dramatic change. In, and it, it, it was it was kind of stressful because at the same time I hadn't really I never really had like any official like big coming out during that time or ever really. Like I, I came out to my family gradually over time, but I never really talked to anybody at school about it, not even like a teacher or anything, just like some people who I was closer to. But like most of my classmates didn't know. They thought I was just, they assumed like I was just like a really hardcore tomboy or like a lesbian or something. And so seeing me start to change and start to look more like the opposite sex was really just crazy for them to observe, especially because I was still using the, the girls facilities. And I, I felt guilty about that. Like I wasn't comfortable about that because I knew I was making other, other girls uncomfortable. Yeah. Were you ready to go in with the boys room? Um, not until high school started. That was when, that was when I was going from this small school out in the country to this, uh, this pretty decently sized high school, I'd say like between like a thousand to 2000 students. So not everybody knew me before most people. I mean, by the time I was in my freshman year, I already passed as the opposite sex. I had, I had, I actually had a deeper voice than most boys my age throughout high school. Because you're probably on more testosterone than they were. I probably that was. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Were you, what was the feeling like <laughs> when you first started to use the male facilities, uh, changing rooms, bathrooms, stuff like that? Was that dizzying or? No big deal. I mean, at first it was like, wow, this is cool. Nobody knows the thing. And eventually it was like, what if people find me out? Like what could happen to me if somebody knows that I'm actually biologically female and like, I'm just using the bathroom in class and I'm alone with, with them in, in the bathroom and nobody can hear me. Like what, what could happen? Because I, I, I was still small. I was still of a shorter stature and frame than a boy my age so i wouldn't really be able to defend myself well and so I, I started to get bathroom anxiety because mm -hmm. i mean nobody knew nobody knew a thing but just that fear of <laughs> like what if 
Did you, were you okay? Did that feel like a deception that you were pulling on people at all? I felt, it felt kind of perverted almost. Like how? Like just knowing like, I'm not actually supposed to be in here, but I am. Nobody knows a thing, but that it just felt, it just felt sick sometimes. Hmm. And for the most part, this feeling went away after a while and I didn't really care, but it was just one of the many ways that transitioning made me more, more anxious in general. I w this is a, a fear that I had pretty much only in school bathrooms because I would like go to like, like in airports or like public places, I wouldn't really care because nobody would know. But I mean, there are some people who I went to elementary middle school with who did, and there were times when I was outed behind my back. Just knowing that somebody who knows me and could know that I'm not actually what I look like could be yeah. in there with me. Huh. It, it was, it was, it was a bit, it was stressful. Did you start getting the beard and the mustache? Um, I mean, I developed pretty sparse facial hair. It was noticeable and I've actually had to, I've gotten laser for it because I had I actually had a, a little bit of a five o'clock shadow, but it wasn't that thick. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's see. Me. Yeah, I I didn't really care much for facial hair. I kind of liked the uh, the pretty boy look I had going on. Okay. I don't know if you'd seen yeah. any uh, older pictures of me. The but... Twink aesthetic. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> huh. I mean, it was the only thing that would look right, anyways. Huh. Did you did you get a chance to fall in love in high school? High school. I mean, not really. The, the people who were interested in me that I knew in person were kind of creepy. Oh, okay. A and I'm not, I'm not just like older? being, ju yeah, my, my age, oftentimes a little bit huh. older, like in, there were like f seniors reaching out to me over like Snapchat and Instagram when I was just an underclassman. And so there is that really weird dynamic of this person's an adult and I'm barely into my teens. Yeah. And it was often, it was almost always like very, very sexual in nature. And it felt like nobody really liked me for me. It was just that, uh, that uh, thrill of like, I mean, I, that, that, that kind of, I mean, I, I do, I do live in like a more liberal state, but I, I, again, I, I live in a more conservative area and there's still like being gay is still kind of a taboo, especially like in among like high schoolers and young people. Yeah. So most of them didn't know that I was trans, but just like being with like, I think I had this appeal of like, I was younger, like a little, like, like smaller in frame, slightly effeminate. And I, I knew that's what was going on. And I just, it made me feel gross. Huh. But at the same time, I kind of entertained it because it was the only tension that I thought I was going to get. Did you, did you have any other places to get attention? Like clubs or? Again, I keep on going back to art, but even like a church group or like some sort of like sporting events. No, Did you just no, I stopped doing sports or no, no, I couldn't, I couldn't do sports because my, my grades were too low because I got really depressed. Wait, but your grades were too low. So they wouldn't let you exercise. Your yeah. Body? There's, there's a, what? yeah, there's a grade requirement for sports for, for, for joining a team. I don't know about that. That doesn't seem right. I feel I mean, like it would have helped if anything, just like, that's what I was thinking. I was really, I was really depressed. That's why I wasn't doing well in school because I couldn't focus and I didn't, I just stopped caring for things. I, I feel like if I had like that sense of, of camaraderie and like working towards a goal together with other people and building relationships, it wouldn't have been like that. Yeah. But when, when did your depression yeah. hit it? I uh, think I, I was diagnosed um, when I was 15, but I, I, I stopped going to church at a pretty young age. My parents stopped taking me and I wasn't really 
interested in being a part of the clubs at school. I felt like I wouldn't really get along with them and I didn't really want to be, there was like a GSA at my school. I think California requires a GSA to be in every school. Really? But <laughs> I, I wasn't, I didn't want to be like a GSA kid because I, I, throughout my transition, I actually didn't really like the trans community. It, it, it was just, it's, it was just too full of like infighting and just not something that I really wanted to associate my, myself with, especially because I didn't want to be, I didn't want to talk about this thing. I didn't, I just wanted to be a boy. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I wasn't really, I felt like I didn't really have a community, but I did have kind of built like a small following on social media. And that's kind of what was your I persona? Got, what, was, what was your persona online? Um, what were you into? What was your shtick? It was mostly just like video games and memes. Okay. Yeah. Were you kind of nerdy then in a way or kind of edgy, yeah. I guess maybe? <laughs> maybe a little bit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Four <laughs> chan style or just no, not no, not, okay. not or, that far. What would you? Well, what, would, do you what do we mean by four chan style? Well, I, that's what I'm saying. Like how how edgy were you is the is the probing question. But maybe you don't want to out just how edgy your teens were. To keep that part of your life under wraps. But just really <laughs> like like your sense of humor, like that like where you start to develop like interacting with people online as a as a source of self expression and. Confidence I mean, building, stuff like that. Some of it was was about like politics, but like not really that serious. Um, it was mostly around like video games and uh, just kind of nerdy stuff for the most part. What games? Um, I really like Metal Gear when I oh. was in my teens. Okay, yeah, All right. and um, Halo. Just some some games that I played as a kid. I can't remember all of them. Yeah, yeah. I just just uh, curious about your aesthetic. When when you got depressed, did you end up doing more online stuff or? Yeah, I mean, I felt like it was the only place that I really had to to turn. Yeah. And you said you got diagnosed. Did they at all consider the effect of what they were doing to you physiologically with the drugs and maybe this? <laughs> so the, here's the gender dysphoria and then here's the depression. Yeah. And Chloe's just somewhere in between. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't diagnosed with depression until I was in my sophomore year of high school. And the thing that actually triggered it was somebody at school like overheard something I said, and they were worried. And so they reported me to the the office a few times. And this, this happened a few times. And several times, they just like kept it under wraps. They didn't really do anything about it. Because I would just be like, Oh, yeah, I'm okay. Like, I didn't want to, I was scared. Like, if I was honest about my feelings, I would be sent to like an institution or something. Huh. But yeah, after after a few after it happened a few times, they I guess they had to report to my parents that I was feeling suicidal and that um, oh I can't remember what exactly the process was, but I had to like sign a form, take it home, get a call home from the counselor, and that was when they started sending me to therapy again. Because I stopped going to therapy because my gender dysphoria was result was not like resolved, but it was being taken care of. And I seemed very happy for a while. Huh. And then the honeymoon period of transitioning was starting to wear off. I started becoming lonely again. Yeah. And I started to become worse off. And it's not something that I've talked about a whole lot in these interviews just because it's something that I'm really ashamed of and I just don't really know where to when to start the conversation but I also uh, after my freshman year I started to use substances because I, I had friends around me who were doing that and yeah. I mean before when I was in middle school 
I, I still had friends who did, but I would strongly disapprove of it and I didn't really care for that kind of thing. But after I started taking testosterone, I think I became more suggestible and more prone to doing stuff that was dangerous. Yeah, less risk averse. That, that makes total yeah, sense. more yeah. yeah. So how hard was your uh, fun times there with those substances? Just do smoking weed, is that what we're talking about or stuff um, like that? Yeah, I would, uh, it was mainly like marijuana and um, sometimes alcohol. And I tried nicotine a few times. I didn't really care for it because it just made me dizzy and gave me a headache. But in my, in my junior year, I actually tried uh, psychedelics a few times. And I think I should get into that later because that's actually an important part of my transition and detransition. Okay, yeah. Did, was the was the alcohol and the marijuana uh did they help with feelings of loneliness depression sadness were was there any sort of or was it just something you did with the with the bros or whatever it, just it was something high. that i started yeah. yeah it was something that i started doing socially and then i discovered like wow this is i think this is really fun it makes me feel good i want to keep doing it and it almost became like a ritual for me to smoke like after school it's it became like a habit and I actually developed a bit of a dependency. Yeah. And did that precede the depression? You started getting depressed. You lost your sense of purpose at the same time as substance. Yeah. I, yeah, I started to, I was already depressed before that, but I think that kind of that, that definitely exacerbated it. And did your therapist provide any help? Say, well, why don't we get you clean, um, get you a Yeah, that head. was... What was the quality... What, looking back, what's the quality of the therapy that you received as a, as a teen and as a kid? Not great. No? I mean, it was pretty much all my therapy appointments after my eighth grade year. Um... We're just over the phone through the Kaiser Permanente app, like a Zoom call almost. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're difficult, like the audio quality was bad, like the connection was always an issue. And I, I just hated being on them because nothing, they just weren't productive. They would tell me like, oh, like do this, like don't download this app. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't really get. There like, was nobody there with like you. I would talk about my like I would talk yeah there was I, I would talk about my feelings, but it just felt like I was getting oh okay so that's that's how you feel I would I would get a questionnaire at the beginning of every every meeting how are you feeling today how are you feeling this week and the meetings were I think they were like roughly every month so it, there wasn't there was too much time in between to uh too many things happening between these appointments for it really to be productive and there was one time when my therapist just was like oh you should download these apps to help with your depression which is a pretty <laughs> pretty bad idea considering i also had a phone addiction okay yeah i feel like it's a bad idea to recommend a kid to use their phone even more because I'd say most kids nowadays are pretty dependent on, on them. They use them more than they should be. And I definitely was. Yeah. I still do. Well, uh, as do I. Um, did you have an elder at all? I, Cause you're making me think, you know, uh, we kind of lost the practice in, in our society of giving boys a boy education, teaching boys how to become men and teaching girls how to become women because that's sexist or whatever. Um, but I think that there's nece necessary developmental needs for boys to be around men and learn how to deal with the libido, learn how to deal with the risk aversion, learn how to be smarter, right? So we yeah. don't have that in our society. And then you, we take somebody like you who lacks, who lacks being trained or being uh, mentored as a woman in such a way that you do grow into yourself as a woman. And then you're put on all this boy drugs and then you don't have anybody to help you to deal with that. Like right. in a personal right. level. Right. I got this, these, this high dose of 
male hormones and this massive increase in my libido and all these difficult feelings very quickly within a matter of a week even and i wasn't really warned of any of that i i wasn't really i also never really got any guidance on how to deal with that from the therapist I think, or from anybody no nobody nobody yeah. and what about um anger uh, or your emotionality, did that change under testosterone for you? Yeah, yeah. I became really quick to to anger at times. I was often very, very frustrated, very, very, very angry. But I... It, it, it was it was it was it was difficult to regulate myself in that way. I wouldn't have like violent outbursts per se, but uh, I became very very petty and difficult to to interact with at times when I was when I was upset, yeah. and I, at the same time it was also harder to really express myself in a way that was what's the word constructive. I think I became out of tune with myself emotionally. And this inability to express myself made me more depressed. Like I, I was often sad, but it was harder to cry under the influence of testosterone. And when I did cry, it didn't have that emotional release that it used to. And so I could cry and cry and cry for hours on end and nothing. Huh. Wow. And then this depression diagnosis, how do you, how are you treated? Do they just give you another shot in the butt? The happy shot? What, I mean, do they <laughs> Not put in you the on butt. drugs? It was, to, uh, <laughs> it, it was an oral form. It was a pill. They started, I was, I was sent to a psychiatrist and, uh, I, was, I remember specific, yeah, no, I, I made sure that I was not put on SSRIs because I, I know a few people who were put on SSRIs and the horrible side effects that come from it. And I did not want to deal with that. So I was like, I'd like to be put on something with the least amount of side effects possible. And the psychiatrist was like, okay, let's put you on Wellbutrin. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. How did that help um, you or hinder you? Well, I, I didn't know this until I went off of it last year, but there's actually a big black box label for use in children and adolescents because it actually increases uh, the risk of and the severity of suicidal thoughts. Yeah. And I didn't really get much better while I was on it. And when I first started taking it, I, my mouth was really dry, my lips specifically. And I, I would wake up with like painfully cracked lips. Hmm. And it, it, would, it would wake me up in the middle of the night. It was, it was, it was really bad, but hmm. it was hard to, it felt, I didn't really feel much different after being on it for a while. And it was really hard for me to tell, to observe myself. But um, until I was off of it, um, I mean, my, my friends and my family have told me like, you're so much better off of it. Like you were so, you were not stable while you were on it. Like you were very, very upset all the time. Like, like, uh, like what, what, what do you mean? Like depressed or anxious or rageful angry. angry angry okay angry very irritable okay short tempered did you um at the at the most medicated in your life how many things were you on um did it stack up pretty high or were you like well butrin and testosterone for a while and then you swap out with the ADHD meds so there was the, the Wellbutrin, the testosterone. Um, I was also put on uh, topical estrogen because, uh, yeah, because one of the For side effects of testosterone, no, 
one of the side effects of testosterone or blockers are just being in the absence of female hormones in a female body is that the uh, the walls of the vagina start to atrophy. Yeah. And I, I was informed of this and like I I, I thought at the time from from the information I had from the internet and from my doctors that oh I could just yeah that's that's cool I can it's just going to be a little uncomfortable like I can just treat it with topical estrogen once it starts to set in and I did but I didn't know that that atrophy actually affects the rest of the female reproductive system and the organs in the pelvic region so I also started to have issues with my urinary tract which are ongoing to this day good god yeah so I was on testosterone topical estrogen wellbutrin um, short release ADHD meds and then recreational weed <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, not California a good girl mix. man California I, I was tomboy <laughs> wow um uh, I'm sorry uh it's really upsetting to me to hear about the um I don't even know how to say it. I don't want to say the de desecration of your womanhood um, by this, but that's, I'm getting emotional about that. But was it really painful uh, physically? Yeah. Like, the atrophy. Like, like, was it like crampy? Uh, is that what's going on? Or like. I mean, in that area, that organ specifically, it wasn't too bad. But after a while of being on testosterone, it was very sporadic and happened very rarely. There were times when just out of nowhere, um, I would get these horrible cramps, worse than any period I had ever had. And there, the first time I got them, I remember I had just gotten home from staying at my sister's apartment. My mom and dad weren't home, but they were, they were, they were driving there. And all of a sudden, I just dropped to the ground because I was in so much pain. And I had to like crawl across the house looking for pain medications. You're all alone. And, uh, yeah. Oh man. Did that subside, or you took a couple aspirin? Yeah. Once or? I once I went on the top of estrogen, it uh, okay. It stopped. So there. Oh man, I just this is just so convoluted. Yeah. When did you start to say, "Is this worth it?" Or what was the first question that you had about the path that you were taking? What do you mean? When did you start to doubt what was going on with you as uh, transition being the answer? Yeah, so towards the second half, the second semester of my sophomore year was when I started to seek top surgery, as I called it at the time. And uh, First, I told my therapist about this, and then she referred me to a gender specialist to get me a letter to 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 uh, a letter of referral. And then after that, I was was when I had my first appointment with the surgeon. And uh, after that first appointment was when I was recommended to a top surgery classroom they called it hmm. it was it was uh within the hospital building where uh, they would talk to minors and their parents and families about uh, about top surgery and all the different kinds of incisions and the healing process and how beneficial it is for the treatment of gender dysphoria just one big propaganda it was a spiel basically. okay yeah all right um you no, know, it's kind of what kind of I've talked about it a few times before, but what was kind of shocking to me about that class, even then, was all the kids in there looked way younger than me, like maybe around like 12 to 13, most of them. I mean, it was hard to tell because most of them were boys. They identified as boys, okay, but yeah. they were very effeminate looking. So a lot of them were either like very, very, uh, very early into the process of starting hormones or blockers. 
but that that made it all the more difficult to determine just how old they were and it, it was kind of it was it was a little disturbing even but i kind of just brushed brushed it off as like well these they're all just like me right like okay. this is normal yeah and after about two or three more appointments uh six months later i underwent the surgery i went i went under the, the knife and my breasts were gone and i was happy you were happy i thought yeah um, when i initially woke up i was very excited i was yeah. happy that this big step was finally finally over and when i when i posted about it i got that was probably the most support I had ever seen in my life. The most celebration of you. From the trans community and from friends who were allies. It was a lot. It was overwhelming. And, and that lifted you up. It felt positive. Oh, yeah. Um, then th there, there was about a, like a week long period afterward when I couldn't I couldn't bathe the shower just for the sake of the incisions but once I had my stitches taken out and I went back home was when reality started to really hit me in the face I, I went home took off all my uh, my dressings and it's I would have to I would have to remove them and redo redo my bandages every single night after every every bath and every shower and it ruined what used to be one of my favorite parts of the day just going into the shower and being all warm and comfy and just being to myself well now i have to look down at these big wounds on my chest and take care of them and my chest looked awful the post-op period was rough to say the least. And it was, it was around this time that I started to realize like, wow, I really, there's some things about being a girl that I really miss. Like I miss being able to, to paint my, mail, my nails and wear makeup and style my hair and have long hair and wear skirts without judgment. And it was very lonely living life as a boy. I felt like I didn't really have much room to talk about my feelings and my personal struggles and that my relationships weren't as close as they used to be and that I really had nowhere to turn. And this was, uh, shortly after COVID hit. So I also had that element of being isolated and my mind kind of breaking down, breaking breaking down on itself. Um, this is also when I started to, it was during a short period, there was a short period of time when I was experimenting with, uh, with psychedelics and one, on one trip, um, after some time of feeling happy and just ignoring reality, it all came crashing down. I realized like I was, crying on my bed. I don't know how long it had been, whether it was minutes or hours, but I got up and I looked myself in the mirror and I heard a voice in my head saying, you're lying to yourself. You're lying and you need to grow up. And I didn't really know what that meant at the time, but just a few months afterward, uh, was when I realized I couldn't keep on transitioning, that it was destroying me. And that, that was uh, very, very sh also very shortly afterward, after uh, taking a psychology course and learning about, uh, tw towards the end of the course, about like parenting and childhood development. Like, the combination of all the distress I was in and the isolation and quarantine and just everything that, that was going on 
really, really broke me down. But I think, I think really it was, it was beneficial because I was also in a more suggestible state. I was more open-minded and I was thinking outside the box. And I realized like, I want to have kids, but I'm destroying my body. Like I might not be able to, to give birth or have children naturally, but I'll never be able to know what it's like to breastfeed a child. And I couldn't go on like that. I, I knew I was living a lie. Facing that, um, I mean, do you have, did you have any, any sense of being guided or any sense of something loving you, something purposeful about your life, some sort of meaning or, or a sense of guidance, purpose, worth? I just wanted to, to feel loved. I wanted to feel like I was part of a group. I wanted to feel like I was, like I was, like there wasn't anything wrong with me, that I was okay. And that I could just create my own path in life and be happy with myself. And I thought that was what transition was going to do for me. I thought that I was going to become whole. Was the gender specialist all that special? Like, how do they, what is, what is the philosophy of the body of what they're dealing with when they're teaching you to think about your body in this way that they're going to change it? Do you have a sense of what their values are? Just follow the gender affirming care model, right? Okay. You know, you know, it's, you I know, mean, I don't even exactly know what a gender specialist is. Really I, weird. yeah, they, in my experience, they just referred me between people mostly. And I think the gen, my dysphoria diagnosis came from a gender specialist. If anything, it's more like a gender cultist. Well, it's, it's the definition of that meme where if you're a hammer, every problem's a nail. If you're a gender specialist, then everything's gender, right? Like that's the only thing that they're there for. Do yeah. they ever say no? Do they scream? I don't think so. I don't know. They didn't for you. I don't think so. Did you, did you need, or did you get an elder, a mentor or a therapist when, when you began the detransition path or, or I guess the, the detrans community acted somewhat in that capacity for you? Yeah. All I really had for a while was the community because I went back to my doctors who I, I thought because they got me into this, they must... They, they must be able to help me, right? Nope. Nope. What did they say? Um, I got different responses from all of them that were all of to the same effect, really. My therapist just was the same old therapist. She didn't really, just wasn't very effective for me. And my gender specialist, I went back to her. I would, uh, I talked about how much pain I was and how much I regretted transition and I got responses like, well, I've never, I've never had a patient like you before, or, well, isn't this just a part of your gender journey? <laughs> like, I, I, I can't think of any other condition or course of treatment where it'd be like, oh, I don't know, like your, your chemotherapy failed to stop the spread of your cancer. It's just a part of your cancer journey. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So odd. Were you angry? Not quite yet. No. Not quite yet. I, if anything, I sympathized with them more than myself. Hmm. What more than myself? Um, my endocrinologist. I. I told her. Like, I'm not transitioning anymore. I stopped taking these treatments. I've, I've gone off cold turkey. Can you, can you uh, order some blood tests for me and give me the results back so that I, I know where my hormones are at, like relative to most girls my age. 
But when I got my results back, the guidelines that she sent in the email were for teenage boys. And that's when I, it really hit me that I'm not going to get any help from these people. They're not going to help me. <laughs> so why should I trust them? I haven't been, it, it's been hard going back to the doctors for any reason for, for years now. Because yeah. how am I supposed to, to trust any after what's been done to me? Um, about a year after that, um, in, in last August, I think, was when I finally reached out to my surgeon. It, it took a while for me to muster up the courage to do that because I didn't... I didn't think I was going to get anything out of it. Like, this guy's removed my breasts. There's no putting them back on. But that was also when... Uh, a few months after I started having these complications with my my grafts, the skin grafts they use specifically, and they weren't going away anytime soon. They still haven't, but I thought like maybe the therapist, maybe maybe the surgeon would know something about this. I, I should reach out to him. And I had like a five minute call with the guy. I couldn't even get like a physical appointment with him. Hmm. But um, he was kind of rude to me. Like he was just really dismissive. And just kind of, just kind of rushing through the appointment, it felt like he was just like, "Oh yeah, yeah, keep, keep putting bandages over it," even though I was supposed to stop doing that years ago, and I had for a few years, for for about like a year or so. I, but all of a sudden, I was ha I started having these complications, and the skin was breaking down, and I had to start wearing bandages again. And he was just like, "I, I told him all of this." He was like, "Yeah, yeah, just." You you you're doing great. Keep put 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 keep putting bandages on it every day and uh just put some Vaseline on it. So so a week a week later I had a skin infection okay. because I took his advice. Put uh sealing it off with Vaseline. This open wound, I guess, is what you're talking about. Ba basically, yeah. yeah. I, for <laughs> I, is it okay if I like go into a little bit of detail yeah. around the, the complications? Yeah, I mean, so you, if you don't know how uh, how it works, the, the, there, there's multiple kinds of incisions for a, du a gender affirming double mastectomy. I shouldn't even call it gender affirming, but I got the most common type of incision, even though I tried to. I tried to push for a less invasive one because I was I was decently small and I thought I had I think I had pretty okay skin elasticity but the way they did it for me is that they like incised into part of the breast and they took the tissue out and then they also like scraped areas of skin on the chest that they would uh, that they would graft the areolas onto and to make it into a more masculine position that's called double incision with nipple grafts yeah. and at first the grafts were peeling okay i mean they didn't really fully pigment over and they were kind of dry on top but other than that i didn't really have any issues with them when all of a sudden last year um towards the beginning of the summer they started to the skin on top top wasn't really peeling correctly and it started to leak fluid and I have to wear bandages over them every day otherwise it'll get onto my clothing or my bedding and I have no idea what this what 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 this is what's going on why why it's doing this I haven't gotten an answer so it's just a, a flu just a random body fluid or just some sort of like yeah it's like it's clear. Chloe juice, I guess. That's what it is. <laughs> I really do hate that. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks. I hate that too. Wow. Chloe juice. So you're told you're told that you're living a lie and that you need to stop transition. So you stop 
transition, which is a, at least, well, it's a threefold process. There's a social transition, there's a psychological detransition, and then there's the, uh, the physical detransition. And physical detransition is even just a misnomer because it, it's permanent. Uh, it's permanent. Do, right? Um, like all, all of this, my body is permanently changed by this. I'm, I can't just grow my breast back. Um, I have permanent changes to my bone structure, including in my jaw, my nose, my shoulders. Um, they've they've been they've been masculinized, and I can't really do anything much about that. Uh, my hips are pretty narrow because they weren't allowed to to develop, and. What helps you to I don't know what my, accept yourself, uh, accept your body, um, accept that, your state? I mean, I'm still, it's something that I'm still struggling with, admittedly. Like, I, I really struggle with my body image still. But I wouldn't use the phrase... I wouldn't say that I've made peace with it, but like I, I understand like there's, there's not really many going back. And even if I do choose to have a reconstruction of my breasts, I'm not going to get the function back. And so there's not really much of a point other than aesthetics for me to do anything like that. And then speaking and of... Other than that, there's like a there's a risk with every procedure. Yeah. Especially implants and reconstruction, grafting, things like that. It's a gamble. So and about a year ago, you you set up a Twitter account and you started to to tell your story or to speak out. How has that been? for you yeah um at first i just started on on twitter pretty small just talking about like overall what what happened and i i really didn't expect to garner as much attention as i have especially so quickly <laughs> like I've, I've built up a pretty decently sized platform just speaking about my my experience with transitioning and detransitioning as a kid but at first it was just just some posts on twitter and then i had journalists reaching out to me asking about my story and in early last may a, part, um, a nonprofit group called partners for ethical care reached out to me and they were like we know like you're still a kid and it's kind of a crazy idea, but would you like to, to fly out of state and testify on this legislation in Louisiana? And I was like, wow, what an opportunity. Like this, this is amazing. It, it, took, it took some convincing from my parents because like they, they're my mom and dad. Like they, they love me. They're, they're concerned about me. They want me to be, to be safe and okay. And they weren't so sure about me going all the way across the country, especially because I had never really been away from them that I had never really been that far away from them before hmm. on, on my own like that. But luckily they, after some convincing, I was, was able to do so. And I've it's kind of just been what I've been doing for the past year or so not even a year yet like it's been like nine ten months yeah. but it's it's been pretty amazing and i'm i'm really happy that i i get this opportunity to speak out on something that's so so dear to me and something that i know like this is happening to more people than i could ever imagine and i hope that just talking about what's happened to me and my, my own feelings and knowledge on the subject that I can 
help other people, other men and women and children and families who are struggling with this. What do you do with all the attention? It, it's, it's kind of a weird adjustment going from, I mean, I was, I was, I felt like a nobody. Like I didn't really, I had lost all my friends at school. I started homeschooling because, because of that. Really? And other than, other than, other than, other than just going through homeschool and studying for my, uh, for my um, diploma equivalent, I would just like stay at home, play with my dog, play video games and draw and read books and stuff. I didn't, I didn't really do much. And then all of a sudden, not even a year later, I'm like on the go all the time. But the, it's been kind of weird dealing with it. Like it's, it's kind of beautiful that stories like my own have reached such a large audience, such a large number of people. But it, mo mo most, of, most of the attention that I get, most of the, uh, the criticism that I get is positive and I, it's mostly support. But <clears throat> there, it is, it does get a little bit serious sometimes. Like there's a lot of people who make some not so nice comments, especially about my, my body. I get a lot of people talking about like pointing out my, my jaw, my shoulders, my lack of breasts and how huh. the, the lack of development in my body. And it's mostly just people being mean, but it does, it does kind of hurt. But I, I also get a lot of backlash from the trans community, of course. And I, I always have, um, when I first stopped transitioning and I was just talking about the regret and how I felt like I was duped by my doctors and how I felt like I was used like some sort of experiment. I was met with a lot of aggression almost immediately. I had a lot of other trans people who I used to be friends with. The, 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 the people who bullied me the most were actually the same people who celebrated me the most. They celebrated every milestone, especially as they got more and more extreme. The mastectomy was the most exciting thing of all to these people. And once I regretted it, they, they poked fun at me for being, for being in pain, for losing my breasts. I would hear things like, you're not a real woman. You don't, you don't have anything there anymore. Or you, like, how's it, how's it feel? It must be, it must be painful, right? Like you, you deserve to feel this way. You knew exactly what you were doing to yourself. You, you took resources away from the trans community and you need to, you need to shut up and stop talking about, about this because you're hurting us and you're making us uncomfortable and you're going to take the opportunity to transition away from people who really need it. How do you process that kind of criticism? I mean, at first, it was really difficult to deal with that. Before, before I, before I went public. By, by the time that I went public, like I knew like what I was in for, but before, before that, like I was, I was just some kid. I didn't know, I didn't know any better. I, I started to believe what they were saying that I had nobody to blame but myself, that it was all my fault and that I should just stay quiet and stop talking about it. Especially if I was going to hurt these, these people who I thought I was in a community with. Do you worry about that? Taking away life saving care from people? Potentially. It's not life saving. I mean, I'm. My goal isn't to ban transition outright. I think the option should be left to fully developed adults who have been fully informed and have tried other treatments 
for the dysphoria and it just hasn't hasn't worked out for them i think they have every right to pursue transition but this is never appropriate for kids ever It's, I've seen firsthand how this destroys children and their ability to live fulfilling lives by the time that they're adults. Well, I think you look like a painting, so I don't think you should be at all ashamed or worried about <laughs> your appearance. You, you look like like an ideal um, thank you ben you're very you present yourself and and beyond that your spirit is just this glowing torch so and the, the beauty your essence is beautiful so if i'm allowed to say that me, no of course <laughs> and how does the future look for you now that you can't um, be a man when you grow up, what do you want to be? Not a man. And also a mother. Yeah. Um, but before that, I... Once, once all this is over, I might continue to do activism on other issues. Um, but I also want to travel around the world and just see what's what's out there and try all different sorts of food go out on all sorts of adventures and for a career maybe uh i i might do something artistic i mean i don't know just how plausible that is because ai we have this big ai takeover coming very soon but i i might do something like animation, maybe stories. Uh, I like fashion. I like clothing. Maybe fashion design. Really? Yeah. Do you make your own I mean, stuff That's kind now? of been... What was that? Are you making your own stuff nowadays? Yeah. I mean, story. sometimes I make my own designs, but I'm for now I mostly just like buy stuff and coordinate it together. Yeah. Um, that's kind of... That's actually been a pretty important part of uh, my detransition. Really? That I don't really talk about a whole lot. Just like... It's it's given me a way to express myself and to to figure out what what I like and it, it's also something to I mean for a while it when I was when I was in the amount of pain that I was in the initial stages of detransitioning it gave me something to to focus on to work on and I like doing it uh, it's I, I've always been the creative sort. I love, I love making things. I love putting things together. What, what have you learned about yourself in the last year speaking out and has your uh, sadness, anger, depression, uh, abated, come back? How has that been? Well, I didn't know that I could do public speaking. Um, <laughs> was that nerve wracking the first it, time? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's gotten easier over time, but I had no idea that this is something I could do. I, I, I never, I never ever in my dreams thought of, of doing something like this, but it's, I kind of enjoy doing it. Yeah. It's, it is, it is really nice, but I still, feel very painfully about a lot of this, especially around the, the loss of my, my breasts. I think I feel just the same about that and that the pain I and mean, the scars are never really going to, to go away. But overall, I think I've really overcome, overcome it. It's, it, it still affects my day-to-day -day functioning and it's, it's not easy but I'm doing a lot better than it was just a year ago, just a few months ago. And especially while I was on those treatments. Yeah. Do 
you know what you could say to yourself um, at the beginning of your transition or leading up to your transition when you were obsessed with gender, something that that you could tell yourself that would help you out? Or is it kind of an obsession that, that somebody can't be told or talked out of? It is kind of hard to go back in time and extrapolate all all the ways, all the all the different outcomes, all the what ifs. But I if I could go back in time, I'd tell myself just to just to wait it out because these feelings, especially in kids, really aren't always permanent. They usually aren't. And there's often some underlying issues that are behind it. And there definitely were for me. And in every case of a kid that transitions or has gender dysphoria or desire to transition, every single one of them that I've met personally, they do. And very, very serious issues, including especially issues relating to their their family or having been abused or neglected or sexually assaulted. And I should have been assessed more thoroughly. But I think that any kid that is struggling with this they shouldn't make the move immediately to transition, but instead, a pattern that I've noticed with a lot of these just four kids is they really don't have much of a community outside of the internet. They aren't playing a sport or um, in any clubs at school. They don't really have a lot of friends at school. And they're just not really involved in their community or sometimes even their families. And that's really important. That's a really important thing that these kids are lacking. They feel like they don't really have anywhere to fit in. And I feel, I feel like sports are especially important for, for any kid because, I mean, you're, you're working on a team. You're building relationships with, uh, with your coaches, with your, with your peers, your teammates, and you're working towards a goal. And on top of that, you're working out your body and you're, you're building up your, your strength, your stamina. And I think in a way you learn to appreciate your body, not for, not for how it looks on the outside, but for what it can do. Do you have anything, um, projects that you're working on? I guess you do have a Twitter. Do you have a, are you, are you part of uh, Partners for Ethical Care? Is there resources that you uh, think are really important for people to know about? Or that um, you're contractually obligated to talk about in every interview if you're on the payroll? Well, um, this year, I started working with a, uh, a nonprofit called um, Do No Harm as a senior fellow. And they're. Ooh, a senior fellow? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're made up of, uh, of patients, parents, and, um, and physicians. And this is one of the, the, the gender transitioning of children, is one of their areas of focus right now. Um, other than that, I do have a lawsuit that, um, I sent the letter of intent to sue out in last November and the, yeah. I'll be, I'll be suing Kaiser Permanente, which is my entire healthcare provider and also my healthcare insurance provider and the hospital where I underwent surgery, the surgeon. The gender specialist who referred me to surgery and the endocrinologist who put me on hormones and we just filed the letter uh, we just we just filed the lawsuit 
is that like a seven year thing? Yeah, I'm. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not yeah. really. I'm not. I'm not really. Um, I don't know all that much about like the the legal system, but um, I'm working with uh, my attorneys are with Jackson um, Bone. They're they're with they're with Center for American Liberty, and the fundraiser for my lawsuit is on the Center for American Liberty website. Oh yeah. And do you know, maybe at some point I can talk to your lawyer. Um, I'm just interested in how this changes things. So is it, is it, is the intent or the hope that this lawsuit not necessarily punishes those who have done malpractice or mistreated you, but also increases the likelihood of, of more thorough care with regard to gender challenges, um, Right. The various professional organizations challenges California right. state law on this. Yeah. So it's not so much that I want to punish my doctors who put me through this, but I want them to be held accountable for what they did because it's never right to, to, to transition a child ever. <laughs> but that being said, I also want to seek damages for my my care because I have not gotten any appropriate care for my detransition either psychologically or medically. Yeah. Um, and I want to scare other doctors, other organizations out of doing this to kids or encouraging this to be done to kids. Um, I also hope that this will create a precedent and encourage other detransitioners and people who have been harmed by this to seek justice for themselves. Is there, uh, is there heavy, heavy uh, guardrails around this lawsuit where, you know, you consented to this, so there's no responsibility on behalf of the surgeons for what happens afterwards? Is it pretty strong or not? I mean, considering they picked up my case, I think we have some pretty we have a pretty strong foundation. Um, I mean, I did I did sign off on this. My parents had their hand forced in this, and they had to have they had to sign off of it on this, unfortunately. But even if we couldn't argue on the basis that this shouldn't be done to kids, because it shouldn't be, but we live in California where this is the standard, the only standard for gender dysphoric minors. They, well, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't talk about this considering we haven't had any proceedings yet. Okay. Maybe I should okay. leave that to the proceedings. Okay. Yeah. But uh, th th yeah, it's going to be a great um, little John Grisham novel. Hopefully you don't get like <laughs> ransacked by some sort of uh, gender cultists uh, in cahoots with Gavin Newsom or that Scott Weiner guy or something like that. Are you, do you have time for video games anymore? What do you do for fun that's not activist? Um, you raise puppies? <laughs> I, I have a dog at home. Her name's Yoshi. Is it like a doge dog? Like one of those Japanese dogs? Like those <laughs> No, she's not a Shiba, but she's a... We're not exactly sure what she is. She's like a smaller dog, about 20 pounds. She's kind of funny looking. She We think she's like a like a terrier chihuahua maybe like pomeranian mix because she's got them big ears yeah. they, they stick out they're like little radars and they she's got she's pretty pretty fluffy but um so i've got my dog and then i rollerblade sometimes i don't do it as often as i should and i should probably re replace my skates by now because they're kind of kind of beaten up and they're a little they're a little too heavy and also is oversized is rollerblading about just going or do you do rollerblade tricks i don't do any tricks i'm not like a pro i just i like going around and just yeah. just looking around and enjoying myself yeah and also just doing it as like a form of exercise yeah. and um sometimes i do play video games i mean i don't have any consoles anymore and i don't have a gaming computer either uh, but i do i have a switch yeah 
And sometimes I play like smaller, less resource consuming games on my on my laptop. But like Farmville? Sometimes Not I Farmville. emulate stuff too. Stardew Valley. Um I have Stardew Valley on my car. Yeah. And Twitter's a video game. It's just made out of words. <laughs> so it counts. <laughs> it's fun. Oh, yeah, it's fun. Keeps you in trouble or out of trouble? Mm, depends on what you mean by trouble. <laughs> well, I mean the recording there. Because that's the perfect place, too.